Hello and Aibo and to everyone who is joining us today on the second day of the Youth Summit on Climate Change organized by Slack and Trust, as well as the Directorate of Climate Change, Ministry of Environment of Sri Lanka. We had a very successful few sessions yesterday and our youth voice, Mr. Ashan Karunananda, who is the Research and Program Officer here at Slack and Trust, will give us a recap of our inaugural session and the panel discussions we had. Over to you, Ashan. Thank you, Mr. Uh, one second, I'll show you. I hope my slides are visible. Yeah. So, uh, the Global Youth Forum on Climate Change organized by, uh, is uh, happening for the fifth consecutive year. And Slack and Trust has made uh, in involvement throughout the years as Slack and Trust has identified that youth can do an important role in the process of uh, preventing uh, the consequences of climate change. So to begin with, I would like to give a recap on the first day where we have some informative and very in, uh, valuable panel discussion. To begin with, the the session, the, the, the youth program was kicked off with a welcome address by Ms. Washita Vijayanayaka, Executive Director of Slyke and Trust, followed by a keynote speech by Dr. Sunimal Jayatunga, Climate Change Sec Director, Climate Change Secretariat, Ministry of Environment. And then we followed with four good panel discussions, starting with the biodiversity, marine and coastal ecosystems. It was conducted in Singhara by Dr. Tarani Pradeep Kumar, Mr. Anura Satru Singha, and Ms. Timali Dharmakirti. Then an English session was conducted in the team Sustainable Consumption and Production by Dr. Krishna Sugatapal, Mr. Samantha Kumarasena, and Ms. Nadisha Paulis. And during the evening sessions, we moved into the Tamil sessions where our viewers from Tamil uh, who speak Tamil and uh, gathered lots of information from the first session, which was on oceans and coastal ecosystems, conducted by Dr. T. Madhivendan, Mr. Tiru Sripati, and Ms. Ahalya Arunayaga. And the final session for the day was on climate change and disaster risk conducted by Professor Shanti Jisiva and Dr. S. Amalanada. So we had very important points and good discussions. And in the, the following slides, I'm hoping to uh, highlight some key areas, starting with the biodiversity sector. The forest landscape approach has three elements, defining landscape, understanding the existing governance structure, and results-based management plan. Applying global rules and regulations on biodiversity conservation is not enough. Sri Lanka has begun to adopt the forest landscape restoration approach, which has already been adopted by other countries. Some of the threats and issues faced by biodiversity conservation in Sri Lanka include conflicting policies, the increase in demand for land, and a lack of proper awareness on the value of services pro provided by natural ecosystems. Later, moving on to the theme oceans and coastal ecosystems, as an island nation with a variety of marine resources, Sri Lanka has a significant potential for a blue economy. Community-based coral and management restoration, alternative livelihood development, and value addition for currently prevailing aquaculture activities are important to ensure the protection of coral and marine ecosystems. It is important to build a trust-based network between the government, local communities, environmentalists, and other stakeholders as well as promoting equity and gender equality to further ocean and coastal ecosystem restoration and conservation. And also another important point highlighted during the session was the threats to coastal ecosystems, especially the use of dynamite fishing, spear fishing, and also using of illegal netting techniques, which has already harmed the coral reefs as well as the fish which attract tourists in these areas. And an uh, important thing, youth can engage in these areas. Currently, youth engage in uh, activities such as coastal cleanups. But a gap that youth could fill in this area is to prevent this from happening. For example, there is plastic being collected in uh, beaches, but after the cleanup, there should be taken proper awareness programs to prevent this from happening. And I think youth can do this by leading as an example. Following up to the climate change and disaster risk sector, it is important to consider the effect of global warming, the natural and human enhanced greenhouse effects, floods, droughts, and landslides on women, youth, and vulnerable communities. Youth can initiate leadership in their communities, and we must maximize the opportunities available for youth to engage in climate action at all levels. 
the disaster risk uh, reduction action plan 2019-2030 includes elements of mitigation action, early warning systems, climate adaptation, climate resilience, modernization, re relocation, and insurance. Another important area focused in is the use of uh, the protection of water resources using the techniques such as rainwater harvesting, using of op open water tanks, and runoff tanks, which will be helpful in protecting the decreasing water of resources in the country. Finally, the sustainable food systems. Uh, consumers should be aware of the product life cycle of the product that they consume and be more cautious, conscious, and responsible for their choices and lifestyle to promote sustainability. Sustainable lifestyles are shaped by the needs and desires of individuals, as well as social and institutional context. The transformation of change to a sustainable lifestyle is a complex task involving change on many levels in many domains amongst people, governance, and institutions. Eco innovation is the development application of a business model shaped by a new business strategy that incorporates sustainability throughout all business operations based in the life cycle thinking and in cooperation with partners across the value chain. So, and for today, we have got an interesting lineup with several panelists, starting with the climate resilience and food systems, which is conducted in English, just following this session. Then we move on to a Tamil session, which will be on resilient and regenerative food systems. And for the final session, for the uh, national global, uh, the national uh, youth program is the climate resilience in uh, food systems, which is conducted in Singapore. Hope you will be joining us throughout the day, as well as join us throughout the global youth forum as well, where we could have a good interactive session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Over to you, Surana. Thank you very much, Shashan. I think that was a very fabulous uh, recap that you have got there. Uh, so if you are uh, very intrigued about it, because, uh, about this, we would love to say that it is on Facebook. Uh, these recorded sessions are there on Facebook, so you can actually go to slackn.com uh, or slackn FB page and you can uh, watch these videos once again, these webinars, and I can assure you it has a wealth of knowledge and I'm sure you'll be uh, very interested and it will be very helpful if you are in this uh, field especially and to also build awareness and know uh, what is going on in the world. Um, uh, with that recap, uh, we are moving on to our first session. Uh, my name is Suramya Hetyarachi. I'm the Advocacy Manager at Slack and Trust and uh, Ms. Uh, Sinashia Ikanaika, who's the Manager of Program and Communications here, uh, will be the session coordinator. We are also taking this opportunity to say hello to everybody who is watching this live on Facebook as we are streaming this session live. Um, uh, I would also like and make to make an announcement. We uh, earlier this month we called for proposals on the four thematic areas uh, as part of our youth engagement work, and we have shortlisted 14 such proposals. Now these proposals are based on climate change and disaster risk, biodiversity, oceans and coastal ecosystems, as well as sustainable food systems. And these uh, are very interesting proposals, and you can actually go through this. We will put in our chat box the. Um, uh, the link where you can go and read this and you can choose your favorite proposal and uh, choose it wisely because the voting goes on till um, Friday. So choose wisely and tell us which proposal you think is the best. Uh, Senasha will now speak to you about the voting process. So over to you, Senasha. Uh, thanks, Ramya. And yes, we have been reopened for votes yesterday, and it has been buzzing, and we've had lots of votes coming in for the proposals. So to vote, and thank you to the, all those who've joined. Um, so just log on to our websites, like and trusted.org, and once you head on to the events page, there should be Global Youth Forum on Climate Change, that's the first banner on our homepage, and then you'll see all of the event details. Just on the side, you see this little button called Project Proposals. And once you click on that, you'll go onto a new page, which has all of the brief descriptions of the project proposals. Um, so just maybe read through all 14 of these, see what really resonates with you, what you would like to see implemented on the ground. And once you read through all of them, just click on Vote Now, and it'll open up to this box, which is a survey plan of proposal. And kindly note that each uh, email address is allowed to vote once only to make sure that the process is transparent. Um, so yes, for those of us who are on the call, kindly do uh, support these projects. And if there's any project you would like to see uh, implement, 
please uh, vote for it. And thank you and have a good session. Thank you, Sene. So I hope uh, you would be able to do it. And um, these are the projects that we do. It comes from the youth. And I think we really do need to give them the chance to, you know, uh, make it happen. So um, uh, we do encourage you all to do that and uh, vote for it so that, you know, you show your support as well. So now today's topic is climate resilience in food systems. And the panelists will be making their individual presentations. First, we have three panelists. Once the presentations are done, we are open for Q&A and we request you to to type in your questions in the Q&A box that is over there. And um, uh, even if you're in Facebook, please let us know. We will try to moderate and put everything together, compile it so that we can ask our panelists to um, question, uh, answer your questions and your queries. Now, today's first um, speaker is Professor Pradeepa Silva. She's a senior professor in the Faculty of Agriculture, University of Peradini. She has a wealth of knowledge and years of experience. Uh, she will give an overview of food systems as well as uh, the innovative approaches on sustainable food systems and how to perhaps change the perceptions that are currently uh, underway. Uh, Dr. Pradeepa, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Suramya, for your kind introduction and uh, good morning to all of you. Let me uh, share my slide. Hope you can see the slides. Um, okay, so uh, uh, I am supposed to talk about climate resilience in food system. And uh, uh, before I go into details, let me take you through a few slides to introduce or get a better uh, get a better understanding on food system because it is a system that we are talking about. So uh, basically, food system includes all the actors and interactions, all the people and biotic, abiotic factors. If you look at uh, the definition, I borrowed it from IPRI. And um, uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the whole system, it in, uh, includes all the production aspects, uh, uh, product transportation, processing, uh, retailing, wholesaling, and uh, consumption. It does not end there, it goes to disposal and waste management as well. So therefore, when you look at the food system, it, every, it includes everything, every aspect of food, food production, processing, distribution, sales and consumption, and plus the waste management. So because of that, uh, you will uh, see that it is sort of a business. So men, men and women involved there, and the money involved there. So therefore it has socioeconomic aspect as well as that it uh, interacts with the environment because it uses uh, the resources from the environment and also it uh, release waste to the environment. So therefore there are, uh, there's an environmental impact, impact. So given that we'll now look at uh, the whole system uh, when, when we look at the whole food system, uh, there are uh, weaknesses. So these weaknesses in food system leads to vulnerability of uh, food system uh, uh, because of the changing uh, climatic conditions, variable climatic conditions. So if you correct these weaknesses, this is the road, these are, these are leading us to the resilience in food system. So therefore food system should be environmentally sustainable, and climate smart and also inclusive. Why the word inclusive is coming? Because food systems uh, assure the urban and rural connectivity. So the, there's a dichotomy in our society, urban and rural, according to the, 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 the demarcation. So it, this is the connecting path. The food system connects these two ends, uh, rural and urban uh, societies. So given that, let me uh, uh, give you the, uh, the whole picture diagrammatically, uh, uh, the uh, food system. So it encompasses or, or it, it uh, carries four uh, core areas, production, processing, transport and consumption. And transport at, uh, actually coming in different places. So therefore you will find different uh, uh, diagrammatic uh, different definitions uh, given for elaborations, given for food systems. So that is the core. 
but there are a lot of pay players. So uh, when you uh, take the example of production, it includes all farmers, inputs, technology, extension, all the workers there. And uh, each and every co-component is having its peripheral actors. And also all these actions, all these uh, co-areas are uh, uh, interacting in the backdrop of the climate where the resource management and the waste management has to be uh, taken care of. So given that, we will see that uh, the whole food system is having co-area and also there are a lot of externalities and a lot of uh, uh, the peripheral players are there. So these uh, external factors or externalities are shaping the food system because it shields the food system and it, we can use them to make the food system climate resilient. Now I will uh, elaborate the, the resilience and the, uh, the food system resilience in food system and the sustain because these sustainable food system and resilient food systems are uh, sort of uh, referred in, in invariably in different places so they are interconnected so for food systems as we I elaborated it fundamentally influence the environment of the planet so what do you mean by sustainable sustainable sustainability is the ability to maintain the function into the future. So the resilient is ability to rebound or uh, 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 coming out of shocks and stresses. So therefore, once the system become resilient, it can be sustainable. So therefore, resilient food system are sustainable and sustainable food systems are resilient. So having said that, what make or how a food system become resilient. So you can see that the different players are there, different actors are there. So if these players and actors and the systems are operating in different compartments, it will not make the, the whole system. So therefore we have to come out from the disciplinary boundaries to make it a system. And also within the system, we have to have a creative thinking and critical analysis of the whole system to make it resilient. Now, this picture is a bit busy, but I want you to uh, take a look at it because the, the whole system make, we should make a balance of the whole system to make the resilient food system. So as I said, it is a demand and supply. So there should be a balance and there are a lot of actors uh, acting in all the places and there are a lot of externalities working so therefore all elements all actors all externalities need to be partners in bringing the climate resilience to the food system so therefore inclusiveness is important in a food system to make it resilient now we'll see what are the characteristics in resilient food system so i'm talking about farm to fork and beyond so there should be a resilience in production, resilience in uh, processing, resilience in transportation, and resilience in consumption. And also consumption includes the disposal as well. So I will take one by one. And uh, so when you take one by one, the food, whole uh, different actors, different players, uh, different uh, components are having peripheral actors. So there are sub actors and sub elements in each and every co-component of the food system. So if you take production, so production is having sub elements of land, soil, water, environment, energy, technology, farmers, everything. And processing has its own fact, uh, the sub elements. So therefore, climate resilience can be uh, 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 looked at or uh, talk about by taking these components into consideration separately. So if you take climate resilience in food production, so food production resilience can be achieved in many ways. So resilience in resource management, of course, we are dealing with a lot of resources in food production and increased productivity. Uh, uh, I will elaborate in uh, with a a, a few slides uh, there in how to increase productivity and minimize waste and pollution. 
diversification and closed loop production system. So this, this is very important because we are a small country, we are uh, having a limited uh, uh, land resource. So therefore, uh, uh, the, the, the home garden and smallholder systems are prominent in our country. So we, we operate in a closed uh, loop production system. So this is very important in uh, bringing climate resilience and uh, practices to promote overall health of the farming system, minimizing uh, greenhouse gas emission and technological interventions. All these contribute to climate resilience in food production. So let's look at the, uh, the resilience in processing agriculture, uh, uh, processing agricultural commodities. So again, efficient resource management, minimum waste, the food safety, wise packaging and technology also playing a role in uh, bringing the resilience. So let's move on to the next aspect, the food transportation. This is very, very important because we talk about uh, the post harvest losses and losses uh, during transportation. So uh, in our country, you can see uh, there are dedicated economic centers, regional uh, economic centers. So efficient management of distribution line and the, the, the marketing hubs, these are important in bringing resilience in food, uh, transportation and also minimize food mileage. This is very, very important because uh, we have about 18% of our population living in urban areas. So urban areas uh, uh, need to be fed. So all the, the food items traveling miles and miles to reach the consumer. So minimizing food mileage is very, very important. And networking and technological interventions. So these are important because uh, to get the, the, uh, the, the the informed decision uh, that in working and technology intervention is seen. How to bring in resilience in food, food production. So integration is my example. Integration is very important. I think Dr. Daniel, the, Daniel will uh, talk about more uh, on uh, integration and the, uh, the, the animal aspects of it. So in uh, farm integrated farming system, the increased output to input ratio is very important. Uh, where the, it is talk about uh, uh, in total factor productivity aspects and on measuring sustainable productivity. So these are important in assessing the farming system in increasing the production and making it uh, climate resilient. So how to make it uh, uh, the, the increase output with the, or increasing output to input ratio, um, recycling, manual management. So these are important in integrated farming system where the animals are a component and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the re crop residues, utilization of crop residues is uh, one of the aspects in integration. And using uh, the correct resources at correct places. So this is a, a very fundamental concept in uh, integrated farming system where uh, uh, the indigenous animals are coming to the picture in, in low input system. And also uh, having animals and crop integrated, you can uh, increase the, uh, uh, the sequestration rate and the, the percentage, securing environmental health. And also having integrated system, you can multiply the benefits uh, where the, uh, the, the the environmental healthy healthy environment the production environmental healthy production can be achieved okay so uh, again by integration you can shorten the supply chain and closed loop production system uh, can be uh, achieved okay so this picture i've chosen uh, uh, it's from usa you can see that uh, it is uh, 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 put forward by uh, U.S. Farmers Association in 2013. And it, it uh, talk, the picture talks about uh, uh, the integration. And this system is, has been there in countries like ours for many, many years. 
where the, the Lewis system is uh, different from uh, uh, our system, where we have a closed loop production systems. Now they are going back to this uh, uh, with the, in order to bring in the climate resilience input uh, uh, system. Okay, the last uh, uh, two slides. The res resilient food systems help us to achieve many, many things, including a sustainable development goal. And also the last one, the, uh, the food, food system is uh, visualized by a circle, but it is not a closed circle. It, is a, it has all the shapes. It can, uh, uh, it can be shaped uh, according to the need, and also it is dynamic and it is incremental and there's no limit and you can make it to the future as well. So that is why the resilience input system is improving, improving the climate as well as the human well-being. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you. Hello. Over to you, Suramya. Thank you, Dr. Silva. That was very informative. I have, uh, I'm sure everyone else also has quite a number of questions to ask you. We have a question and answer box also already starting to fill up. Uh, thank you very much. I have also questions to ask you, just warning you. Uh, after these sessions, we will also get back to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Daniel is our next speaker, Dr. Sam Daniel. He's the director in farm animal and animal welfare sector in Slack and Trust as well. He has is an expert in animal health management, livestock development, as well as the livestock uh, sector policy uh, in Sri Lanka. He has served as an advisor to cabinet ministers, as well as uh, currently advises the National Livestock Development Board in Sri Lanka. Uh, Dr. Daniel, over to you. So, um, yes, uh, thank you uh, and good morning to everybody. Uh, so it, it was very easy for me because Pradeepa gave a nice conceptual uh, picture of the food chain and just let me see. Hello. Sorry, I lost the... To Daniel, we can hear you and your presentation is currently uh, uh, shared. Well, I can't see that. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, uh, we are on the first. Uh, we are we are on the first slide, so you can uh, start on it, Doctor. I'm I'm not sure why you can't see it, but we it is currently. Uh, all right. Okay. Huh? Yes. Now I can see. It. Yes. Okay. So, all right. Uh, so as I Thank said, you. so Pradeepa made my presentation uh, easier because she gave a nice conceptual picture of the system, and what I'm going to do today is to focus on one component of the food system, the sweet livestock production. And here, uh, I have uh, attempted to show the, so how the livestock sector is placed in the current situation and its vulnerability. Uh, and that this vulnerability will be further aggravated with the climate impacts, because already it is in a very vulnerable situation. Uh, but giving that and giving uh, and explaining the uh, potentials the livestock sector offers, it will also uh, show you how you can build resilience in some of the actors in the livestock uh, value chain. Uh, and finally, I also will try to convert these things into where the youth can fit in and how the youth can also make a change in building or improving the resilience of the livestock sector. So in the first slide, of course, it's uh, mostly what Pajipa said. We'll skip that because it says uh, livestock sector, uh, sorry, food system is what it is. So as I said, I will focus the presentation on livestock production. And here I, uh, uh, as you see, uh, <coughs> The, the three commodities I have shown, like from the livestock sector, which is milk, meat, and eggs. And as regards milk, our import dep dependence is still 55%. So, though we have been talking about dairy development for the last so many years, we are only producing uh, about 45% of our requirements. And we depend to a large extent on the uh, milk imports. Uh, 
even with those large imports, we are still indicating about 31 kilos of milk equivalents per year per person. And from wheat, which is mostly chicken wheat, is 9 kg. And, and as regards eggs, we have 224 eggs per person per year. So both for eggs and meat, we are not depending on imports, though there are imports as you, as you see in supermarkets, but those are for very niche markets and niche uh, uh, consumers. So next slide, please. So, uh, as 20 percent now, this <coughs> our food systems can is under threat because of the climate change, plus also the other externalities like urbanization, demographic changes, unexpected shocks like the what we are experiencing now with this COVID pandemic, uh, plus the financial and political crisis. Uh, so, so our challenge is now how to maintain production of sufficient and nutritious food in the face of all these challenges, particularly climate change, and build resilience the capacities in the food system at this to meet our future uncertainties. So now I'll <coughs> touch upon the one little bit aspect. And here again, I, I don't want to, because livestock will include cattle, goats, buffaloes, pigs, poultry, all these species. So I'm not uh, trying to elaborate on all, each of these. But if I just focus on the dairy sector, it is characterized by large number of small holdings, which again has very poor feed resources. And the animals, though they have the genetic ability, which means they can produce, but they are performing low. And these, are, and these animals are often burdened with diseases. And the farmers who keep these animals are uh, burdened with weak infrastructure in terms of milk marketing, maybe, or getting services. And the farmers have low skills, accessibility to technology uh, is difficult. Plus, they are also burdened with policy conflicts. Uh, if I may just about, touch upon the last one, which is, it is, uh, you know, now uh, various people will come and say, ban slaughter, ban this, and or stop imports of that. So these are again conflicts which, which affect the. Uh, food system. So, next slide, please. So, given these vulnerabilities and and the poor performance that we see, see, so for instance, now we have 1.5 million cattle, and about half a million buffaloes. Not all these cattle are kept for milk, I'm saying, because as you will see, if you drive to eastern province like Ampara or but you will see large herds crossing the road, or even in one area, which are herds of cattle or buffaloes, but they are not kept for milk. They are mostly kept as a like resource of wealth. They are, whenever there's a cash tea, they will sell some cattle because they are uh, living in areas with a lot of abandoned natural resources and common property uh, resources. So they just rare animals not for milk, but for other purposes. That's why I said, so most of the numbers are for, in terms of purpose, but only about 35% of these numbers make for milk, and the rest is for other purposes. Then again, in, to show the vulnerability of this, out of this, even out of the animals that are kept for milk, only 20% are managed intensively, which means they are being looked after properly with proper sheds, yeah, good feed, yeah, cow comforts, on it and nearly 80% are on the semi intensive Because most of the uh, uh, extensive systems are on the rest of the, that's 65%. Out of the milch cattle, about 20% on the intensive management and 80% on semi intensive Then again, in terms of, when you look at the holdings, you find 95% of this intensively managed so, sorry, this uh, dairy cattle are kept by small farmers, and only about 5% of these animals are in the so called large commercial dairies. Then, 
when, again, when you try to look at the more, little more deeper into the herds, you find nearly about 40% of the, only about 40% of these herds are productive. Which means they will either produce milk or can produce milk. Whereas 60% of the herds are in general young animals. And mind you, just again, get a bit from this. Why this herd structure also may be because of the climate uh, impact. Because when, the, because when there's heat stress, the animals will not come into uh, heat or the, their breeding will be affected. That, so there will be infertility. And as a result, large numbers of the animals will be kept, but they are not producing. So that's, a, that's an adverse effect of the climate change. But even right now, what we see are very vulnerable herds. And with further uh, deterioration of climates, these parameters will be affected bad. Okay, when you, when you look at the breed composition, nearly 85% of these animals are good breeds. So we feel they have the potential, but they're not performing well. That again is linked to climate impacts and through feed and through other uh, uh, impacts. Okay. So to elaborate the performance patterns in the central province, which, which also has the lower area, which has the highest average per animal production, about 11 liters per day, because it's martelly and candy is also included in the central province, the average per farm, that's the important thing, average per farm comes down to seven. So what it shows is because of the large number of unproductive animals kept in the farm and the poor production of animals from uh, martelly or candy, the central province average also per farm comes to seven liters. And interestingly, you see the per farm average in Colombo district of Western province is six, which is good. That's probably because the market is there, they probably get better prices and animals are looked after better. They are protected from adverse weather effects. And as a result, they, they get comparable uh, volumes compared to central province. Next slide, please. Yes. So, so what? So what should be our focus then? As I said, the because we should try to focus on the larger uh, what portion, which is the semi-intensive production system. And as Pradeep was saying, now most of the most of the sensitive, sorry, semi-intensive farms are crop farms keeping animals under maybe under coconut or with uh, some other crop or with health paddy and livestock integrated. So that's why I said the approach should be on a holistic approach for technology transfer because uh, we see the synergies between crops and livestock. So we can, if, the, if the people, whoever who sort of tries to make these people adopt technologies for resilience building, we can have a, it is not like just uh, one stop approach where livestock people will go and tell only about livestock, about their diseases or their management. It should be a, in a both crop, livestock, and other values. Like they have the value of nutrition to the family, they have the value of using crop residues from the farm to the animals. They will also have some environmental benefits by having livestock in their farms, uh, helping sustainable uh, crop production. So, like that, it, we should have a holistic approach in helping people to uh, appreciate the value of livestock in the farm systems and then the build system. And in doing so, I, I find one important uh, partner that is now uh, promoting village level entrepreneurs. Now, recently the Department of Animal Production and Health, which is the primary so main department, uh, in the technology transfer of um, livestock sector, they are promoting uh, silage uh, as a as a feed, as a feed source, and it is supplemented by some uh, activity by another foreign funded project. So now we are we are we are having a uh, system where, unlike in the past. Where even fodder can be bought in as a commodity, whereas earlier people had to use to produce their own fodder for their cattle. But now, at least some people are, have the access of buying fodder from some from people who are making 
order in uh, tradable packages and also in, in uh, conserved forms like silage and hay. So now forage is a tradable commodity and we can promote entrepreneurs. So this is again where the youth can look at opportunities. How, because after all, if you, if you recall all the sort of poor statistics I performed, I showed about the performance and about the breed structure, sorry, head structures, it, it all boils down to nutrition. And here is the is one solution where we can now uh, breed for the, if the, the farms don't have their own fodder uh, and improve their production. Then to complement that activity, we can also have use of IT because uh, this, this, that project I was mentioning, they have also developed a trade app where they can find who are the people who will sell foragers and who will and who are the people who will own foragers. So it tries to sort of bring in the uh, suppliers and the buyers uh, to this IT platform. And of course, st it's still not popular, uh, probably because the people who keep cattle are not uh, IT savvy. And this again, an area where the youth can mobilize the, the sort of younger generation of the farmers uh, to sort of access these technologies and help their parents and later also take uh, taking for uh, technology applications in their own farms. Similarly, there's another one, uh, app, uh, application called Savia where people can, uh, that, that's a dialogue promoted one, where people can have uh, extension messages by registering with their uh, with their network. Similarly, there's also another app called Russian Formulation Tool where people can download this tool to their uh, smartphones and uh, can find what, how it, exactly they should formulate a ration to their cattle. So technology, technology gap had been a major impediment to the development of the resilience and uh, because of the institution of institutional structures, the difficulty in accessing farms, uh, technology transfer had been rather slow and uh, we believe that at least now getting IT also into it huh, will have some huh, remedial effects in the future. Next slide please. No, same thing. So I think uh, that's the end of the presentation. You don't get the master? No. Or maybe we like it. No, what I want to say the last was about not, not to sort of uh, uh, miss the two other, three other important uh, uh, partners that is the buffalo circuit baking, village level chicken and dairy goats for uh, milk production. Uh, these are again small segments within the livestock sector but still have a lot of value in the uh, food chain and uh, the people who keep these uh, either goats or the buffaloes or village chicken are again uh, severely handicapped because of technology, because of uh, access to institutions and uh, other services. So, uh, but again, as I said, having some entrepreneurs, say for instance, if in the case of village chicken, uh, I know now, although now poultry is very well developed and eggs are trans transported from the northwestern province to even to the east or north, Still, there are hinterlands where eggs are not huh, available for purchase. So having laid chicken more as a, like a supplementary income and also for uh, home nutrition and nutrition in the localities, improving nutrition of families in the localities will have a place. But there again, uh, they can't get uh, the, the chicks for rearing. What they do is the very, very uh, what do you call, uh, the, the village chicken they are breeding, but I know they can. There are also chicken strains which are not uh, not the ones that are available for commercial farms. But you can have uh, chicken strains which are resistant to village level conditions. And any entrepreneur trying to sort of get these type of uh, products available in the villages will also help village chicken. There again, and of course, you not in the uh, way they are free range manner, but in a semi intensive way, so that we can also have some disease control and control of uh, their nuisance to the crop farming areas. 
So that's what I want to uh, present today, and I, I'm willing to answer any uh, questions regarding my presentation later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Daniel. That was a, you gave us a new perspective to the livestock sector and how, how climate change has actually impacted it. Thank you very much. The information you sh shared with us is invaluable. Um, I will now call upon uh, Nipon, Nipun Dias, who is uh, our research and program officer. Nipun, um, he works on thematic areas of climate change, agriculture insurance, disasters, and disaster risk uh, transfer. Um, he will speak, uh, he will be the youth voice today and will speak about youth engagement in agriculture market development activities and of course the examples that have been carried out. Over to you, Nipun. Thank you. Thank you, Surama. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, we can look good. Ah, thank you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the climate uh, resilience in food system. Basically, uh, it's an uh, overview of the uh, food system that uh, Professor Pradeep Asil and Dr. Daniel already have uh, spoken about. Also, I have included a case study uh, from one of our project. Uh, since I have lived in time, I had quickly go to my uh, first slide. Okay, uh, I think uh, firstly, it's better to uh, know about the comp components or the things that included in the food system. Before I go in detail about my uh, topic, I think Prof uh, Professor Pradeep Asila already uh, uh, has spoken about this. Uh, agriculture, livestock and fisheries are the uh, main three sectors that uh, most of the livelihoods and uh, workforce depend on uh, or they rely on. And there are other sectors as well, like forestry, uh, but agricultural, livestock, and fisheries are the uh, 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 main three sectors of the uh, most of the countries, in uh, including uh, Sri Lanka. And also, food system is uh, consists of not only farmers, but it is an entire supply and value chain of agents, including uh, seeds and uh, fertilizer suppliers, transporters food companies and retailers and also uh, consumers. And there are also a number of uh, support systems such as uh, financial uh, providers uh, of loans and insurance, and also information and technical training uh, services with their forecast, and also extension services, health and education sectors, and also um, a social production systems are also part of the uh, food system. So we should understand that food system is a complex network that interconnected with uh, so many parties and activities involving in the production, uh, processing, uh, transport, and the consumption. So next I'm going to talk about the global state of the food security. Uh, we all know that uh, the food habits are changing and our population is uh, growing day by day. So because of this, the human-induced uh, climate change, many of the developments gains of the uh, past decade has been hindered. And so we need uh, adaptation strategies uh, to achieve in food security in the agricultural sector. And uh, we know that uh, the most of the smallholder uh, producers, farmers, as well as uh, women and indigenous people are the most uh, vulnerable group to the, those effects. According to the uh, uh, FA report, we have increased uh, uh, food production by at least 50% to feed the extra 2 billion people that we uh, live on our planet by uh, 2050. And uh, the FA report uh, further mentioned that uh, estimated number of uh, undernourished people has uh, increased from uh, 770 million in 2015 to 800 million in millions in 2016. If you refer the, the graph in the left side, you can see that the number of under Irish people has uh, decreased till 2015, but then it began to increase in each year from 2015 to 2018. So I think food insecure is one of the global issues that we have at the moment. On the other hand, uh, this rising uh, demand seems to uh, clash with the goals uh, to reduce greenhouse gases and build climate resilience and uh, zero emission future. I think we have to uh, uh, re uh, rethink about this aspect as well.
Then I'm going to discuss about some climate hazards and their impacts. The most of the uh, countries affecting include in Sri Lanka. So the crop cultivation or the agriculture sector would be affected by temperature increase, changes in rainfall patterns, uh, water scarcity, and then including extreme weather events, uh, including storms, floods, drought, and uh, slow set impacts like uh, sea level rise, uh, decreasing uh, soil quality, also the increasing of uh, pest and diseases. And livestock sector uh, could be suffer from droughts, floods and heat stress, and also from uh, secondary impacts uh, like yield and quality of the field crops, uh, reduced availability of the pasture, and also uh, changing in uh, growing season of uh, forage crops. And fishery, fishery sector exposed to uh, all weather events, uh, uh, including the ocean ecosystem, changes in coastal and marine ecosystems, uh, also uh, inland uh, fisheries are affecting from uh, uh, drought and uh, water scarcity. Okay, the higher temperatures and water scarcity and extreme events like drought, floods, and uh, the greater uh, CO2 uh, carbon dioxide uh, concentration in the atmosphere have uh, already begun to impact the crops around the world. If climate changes affect the food production, it could be uh, the reasons that is also affect the food access uh, and the climate change and weather disasters such as floods or droughts. Uh, those can lead to uh, uh, inflated prices for the food that is uh, available. And uh, according to the record, poorest household affecting much from the uh, uh, price uh, fluctuation because they are spending up to 75% uh, of their total budget on uh, food alone. And the third thing is that uh, the climate change impact not only affect the food production, uh, it also decreases the nutrition and nutritional value. Climate change can adversely affect, uh, 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 affect the nutrition and nutrition value of the food that is grown. Studies shows that uh, the higher uh, uh, carbon dioxide concentration reduces the uh, protein, zinc, and iron content of crops. And by 2015, an estimated additional 175 million people could have zinc deficiencies, and addition 122 million people could be uh, protein deficient. And the more climate changes, the more food we loss on annual basis. According to the uh, UN uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the or the FAO, uh, FAO roughly one third of one third of the uh, food produced by the farmers is uh, 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 lost between the uh, field and the market in low and middle income countries. So I think we have to uh, think about this aspect as well because this is a global issue. So uh, now uh, next I'll go to a case study as an example. This is about ongoing research uh, focus on two districts. Actually, this is a, a part of our, one of our uh, project, major project. Uh, we are mainly uh, focusing the Anuradhapura and Trincomalee districts. Uh, our data uh, collection uh, was conducted based on uh, four DS divisions from uh, July to uh, September. We have selected uh, two DS divisions in each districts and um, we have interviewed uh, farmers to collect information about their knowledge in climate changes and uh, adaptation to climate change. We have conducted about 145 individual interviews in both districts. Uh, also conducted six group meetings, including the uh, two youth workshops and four farmer workshops. Uh, and uh, for the youth workshops, about uh, 63 participants were participated and for the farmers workshops, about 180 participants were participated. Also, we had a few meetings with uh, the government officials as well to uh, get some uh, necessary information for our research. Uh, these are a few pictures that we have taken during the individual interviews and the workshops. Now I'm going to uh, present some research findings from the individual data collection that we have conducted. I think uh, from this, uh, you all can understand how our food system is affecting by the climate change. First, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to talk about how these communities in each uh, district affecting uh, from the climate changes. 
you can see that the 92% in both districts are affecting from high temperatures or the heat waves and 84% uh, from the Anuradhapura district and 98% uh, from the uh, Trincomalee district. And flood is uh, not affecting much to the uh, people in those areas, but 43% uh, people have experienced uh, floods in last decade. One of the main problems that they are facing is the water scarcity or, or the drought. Uh, totally 81% uh, from both uh, districts are suffering from the uh, water scarcity or the drought. And 67% from Anuradhapura and in Trincomalee district, 67% uh, 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 from Anuradhapura and in Trincomalee, the percentage is uh, very high, it is about 93%. And there are, uh, we identified that there are few water distribution projects uh, in those areas, but uh, some people are not getting benefit from those projects. And 88% um, in both districts affecting uh, rainfall changes. Mostly the people are uh, suffering from erotic rainfall patterns in Anuradhapura and Trincomalee district. This is a problem. It is a huge threat to their cultivation. Uh, farmers have mentioned that for the cult, uh, paddy cultivation, there are a huge threat from fungi problems. Uh, for the other uh, crops, especially for the mass cultivation, uh, uh, there, there, uh, there was a huge threat from the uh, Sena caterpillar. And 71% um, from those districts have mentioned that uh, uh, soil. Uh, 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 71% from those districts have mentioned that their soil has uh, degraded and 61% from uh, both districts have uh, mentioned that they have uh, noted wind changes during the last decade. So all you can see that the most people in those areas are affecting highly uh, from the climate changes and most of the reported issues in uh, those areas are relating to uh, the climate changes. Uh, this graph, uh, this chart shows uh, the, how the farmers are, are adapting to new practice strategies. If you refer this, uh, the graph, you can see that the 36% uh, percent, uh, from the uh, board districts use improved uh, of the rice uh, resistant uh, rice varieties. Mostly they are like to use a BG350, BG352 because uh, those uh, varieties are uh, high resistant to pest and uh, diseases and also that uh, doesn't need much uh, water. And 28% uh, having a secondary income source and 31 uh, shipped in plants, planting or the harvest cycle depend on the uh, rainfall. And 17% um, having a, a new harvest or uh, planting uh, methods and rest followed the traditional methods. 24 having improved or the uh, water management and the most important thing is that uh, even their cultivation land is highly vulnerable to the climate changes, only 17% having a crop insurance for their cultivation or, 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 or they are about the cultivation, uh, about the uh, crop insurance. And 70% uh, have abandoned the agriculture due to uh, various reasons. Most of them are moving to different jobs uh, from agriculture before, because the huge losses in the agriculture. So uh, referring to those results, all, all you can see that the, some of the farmers are trying to adopt the climate changes, but the problem is that those adaptation, are, uh, those adaptation strategies are uh, enough to face the climate changes. So I'm going to the final slide. This is I'm going to talk about from this slide. Uh, a few potential risk management strategies. Most of them are uh, Professor Pradeepa Silva has already uh, explained, but I'm quickly go through the uh, few these uh, points. The first point is traditional and informal uh, risk management strategies. This could be include all the risk management strategies like risk awareness, risk uh, assessment, and risk reduction. And also there are other numbers of um, uh, traditional informal uh, risk management strategies like live fruit diversification. That means that integrating livestock with agriculture and also that this could be including um, uh, risk sharing and information exchange can be also a uh, part of uh, this uh, uh, traditional and informal risk management strategies. And uh, 
My second point is so that uh, the risk prevention and reduction. So this include adaptation measures and also can include uh, climate uh, smart agricultural practice and uh, enhancing the early warning systems and uh, with the forecast also enhancing the climate information system and we should uh, let the farmers uh, to access the, the data. So all these can be included under this point. My third one is the strength in the food system efficiency and productivity. This can be done if the farmers have a better access to machineries with the uh, 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 new technologies and also we, uh, uh, better with the better agricultural practices and providing uh, farmers a uh, uh, low interest loans and uh, also uh, access to uh, the market data. All these can be uh, included in the, including in the standing uh, food system efficiency and the productivity. My last point is that uh, the risk transfer mechanism and uh, climate insurance. I think we, through a better crop insurance mechanism, farmers can uh, share the risk or the reduce the risk. So following those things, uh, these uh, uh, adaptation measures or the uh, the manage risk management strategies, I think we can minimize or reduce the risk in uh, food systems and make uh, uh, the food system is a climate resilience one. So that's all from my end and thank you all for the listening. Now back to you, uh, Suramya. Thank you. Thank you, Nipun. That was a very uh, informative uh, presentation, and um, I'm sure there are some questions actually start that have come already. Uh, so we'll be asking you questions in the question and answer uh, section, which is right about now. So thank you very much to all the panelists for uh, creating this dialogue, and uh, a lot of our participants are very interested in this process, and we have quite a number of questions coming in. Um, I will start off uh, with. Uh, Dr. Pratipa Silva. If you... uh, so there is a question uh, from Dennis who is saying, when we build resilience in food systems, how can we make sure that no one gets left behind? How can we best integrate the many uh, informal unregistered farmers and workers along with the agricultural supply chains when, trans when transitioning towards, towards uh, sustainability and resilience. I hope you can hear me, uh, Dr. Silva. Yes, yes, yes uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dennis, for this question. It is a very interesting question. Um, actually, uh, when I talk about uh, uh, the resilience in uh, food system, I just mention about the inclusiveness. So that is the answer to your question. So uh, in uh, uh, if I say correct, in correct climate resilience food system, there, there should not be anyone left behind. Uh, it is a connection between, or uh, it be the connectivity between rural and urban areas. And also, uh, 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 the, I mentioned about the short loop operation of uh, uh, food system in under uh, resilient climate, uh, climate resilient food systems, and also closed loop production systems. So all these are examples or, or the, uh, the, the suggestions uh, 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 to not to leave behind anybody in the, in the production uh, uh, chain, uh, supply chain or, or the, uh, the food chain. So uh, that is uh, the answer uh, from my end. And, and also, um, when you when you talk about uh, some there was a chapter in uh, in uh, 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 somebody raised a question about the crop and animal integration uh, how many programs include crop livestock uh, integration uh, so that also gives some answer to your question dennis so uh, if i say that if you take sri lanka about 95 percent are small holdings and also out of these 95 percent small holdings only 30% is there for soil livestock. All the other 70% 70, 70 of all whole, small holdings are integrated system. So it, these are operating in a, in a short circle and also the supply chain to uh, the livestock production is short supply chain. So input chain, uh, uh, input supply chain. So uh, that is one good example of, uh, 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 of inclusiveness. Uh, in uh, climate resilient uh, 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 cli climate resilient uh, food system. Hope I answer your question. Uh, 
thank you, Dr. Silva. Uh, there is another question that is, I think, linked to it. I will ask that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, does the do we have government pol policies to support this adaptability and uh, this transformation or does it require uh, a more uh, reform or how are we to move forward? If yeah, you can also are, add to it. Yeah, there are, there are uh, many uh, uh, the government uh, interventions coming in. Uh, one of the interventions I can say that uh, the home garden uh, promotion uh, that is one of the uh, uh, the answers that uh, you can uh, put forward as a, a solution for uh, climate resilience uh, uh, or adaptations uh, to climate uh, uh, changes, and also uh, the uh, there are um, uh, many uh, interventions or many programs that government is uh, putting forward to reduce the the food waste. Uh, that is another aspect that you can uh, uh, highlight in uh, uh, the, the uh, climate resilience in the uh, food system. And uh, if I talk about the waste, actually uh, somebody asked uh, in, in one of the questions asked was, uh, uh, does food waste cause uh, greenhouse gas emission? Uh, so food waste does not uh, 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 cause uh, the greenhouse gas emission, but it indirectly influenced greenhouse gas emission because food waste is huge in our country. Uh, in world standards, food waste are 30%, but we are more than that, about 40%. And uh, uh, according to some estimates of FAO, that uh, the world is producing enough food to feed its people, but because of the waste that uh, we, we uh, face the hunger. Hunger. So therefore, in our country also, we are producing enough food, but since we are not using it wisely, so that's why uh, the, 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 the wastage is high. So therefore, we have to look after that aspect when we are talking about the climate resilience, because we are putting more and more pressure to the climate and also contributing to the climate uh, change uh, because of the waste, uh, since that we are not using it wisely. Uh, so we had to uh, uh, sort of put pressure on the productivity and uh, production as well to produce more and more, even though that we are producing enough since uh, uh, the, the wastage is high that we are in this situation. So therefore there are uh, uh, enough programs, uh, enough interventions going on. I, I, I must not say enough, uh, uh, but uh, there are programs, but we have to implement in, uh, in such a way to get the best benefit out of it. Over to you, Thank you. Yes. yes, thank you, Dr. Silva. Uh, my next question is actually directed towards Dr. Daniel as well. And I think, um, uh, Dr. Silva, you can also uh, uh, give us uh, your views as well. Uh, are there any areas in terms of agriculture, livestock, that in Sri Lanka that will have to be abandoned in the future because of climate change? Um, will the adapta adaptation measures be enough to, for all food systems to be resilient in this country, right throughout the country. Uh, Dr. Daniel, maybe you can uh, take it and maybe Dr. Silva also, if you could have, let yes, us know. That was good, uh, Dr. Silva and my area. And if I may just uh, look from a livestock angle, yes, certain areas where uh, animals have been sort of grazing in these natural resources. And with climate change and with unplanned grazing or management, those have become very like deserts or the overgrazing have damaged those natural resources. So people may have to, if, if it continues, may have to abandon. So, so what can we do? Okay, we can help the people uh, in managing their herds and managing these natural resources. These are common properties, but they are not uh, people uh, individually owned. So what people have been doing is to sort of put more animals to get more uh, uh, numbers and then increase the incomes without uh, concerning the resources they are using. So of course one is on the uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, improving the capacity to manage that. At the same time, there, there should also be like policy intervention of how we uh, manage these common resources. Otherwise, it will lead into uh, overgrazing, desertification, and then finally to be abandoned. Uh, from uh, livestock production. That's one. 
can give a, can you think of any other areas where yeah um actually uh yeah dr daniel i also uh I totally agree with you and uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, we have to think about the wise uh, uh, use of the available resources. So, say for example, that uh, if you take uh, animal, uh, different animal uh, uh, breeds and crosses that we are using, uh, so there are certain areas that uh, we recommend them. Uh, but uh, in the case that when we are practicing it, uh, uh, it is not according to the recommendations that, uh, uh, so that will reduce the 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 total or the 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 potential of the uh, potential productivity of the animal so uh, therefore uh, uh, that uh, we have to look at the uh, adaptability and suitability of the resources available and use them wisely uh, uh, in uh, appropriate uh, areas so that will make uh, uh, the, uh, the the productivity of uh, the system um, uh, uh, up to the standards. So otherwise, uh, we will be losing the resources as well as we will be using losing the the, the welfare of the animal uh, as well. If you talk about the uh, the animal agriculture, so that is uh, uh, the the one thing that when we talk about uh, adaptation measures, uh, these are the things that we have to uh, uh, take into the consideration that uh, uh, we use the available resources in a in an optimum manner to get the maximum productivity out of the system uh, so that will help uh, the 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 the, uh, the system to work in a, uh, in an adaptable manner thank you thank you professor silva and uh, dr daniel our next question is um uh, to Nipun. Nipun, uh, Dennis wants to know whether if in the air areas you worked in, did youth report different challenges and issues than older farmers? Is there a gap between the challenges that they find and how did, and there's a second part to the question as well, and how did climate change impact them and especially their education and career choices? Okay, I would, uh, I would like to give an example for that. Uh, we have noticed that during our youth workshops, uh, that when we ask in, when we ask in that question, who is what's your, uh, what what are their uh, future plans? None of uh, them uh, uh, mentioned that they are going to uh, continue their uh, their parents' agricultural works after after them. So that is one of the uh, major issues that we have noticed because it is a, re, a huge uh, risk in the uh, near future. Uh, and I think uh, there are a, a couple of reasons that can be uh, affect to that situation. One thing is that um, the huge losses in the agricultural sector and low income that uh, farmers are uh, getting and uh, they don't want, even their uh, children want to uh, continue their uh, parents' works. That is a, a one, one aspect. Another, another aspect is that, um, that uh, the children or the young people think that in those areas, uh, think that, uh, think that uh, the the farming is a low level job that is a, that is a social uh, social issue that we have noticed uh, during our um, uh, youth workshops so i think we need to address those issues from the ground level uh, as uh, we can do like a capacity building sessions and also some uh, uh, youth workshops that uh, as we uh, done in those areas we can um, uh, 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 we can make them awareness about how important the agriculture sector to Sri Lankan economy as well as uh, to our future. So, uh, by uh, I think we need to address those issues from the ground level. So, this is a, I think this is one of the best example for the how the climate change impacts their uh, future as well as the uh, the food security in uh, uh, Sri Lanka in future. So, yeah. Thank you, Nipun. Um, since you're on screen as well at the moment, I'll ask you a second question that is directed again to you. Uh, this is from Damita. Um, uh, what reasons would you think, in your opinion, that there is a low, there are low, like there's, there are low adaptive uh, solutions used by farmers in Shinko and Anuradhapura? What do you think in terms of in your view? 
I why think the, is... one of the major reason is that uh, the lack of awareness. That is the main reason that we have noticed. And uh, it is about, uh, okay, I'll give a, uh, one example that uh, when we are, as I mentioned in my uh, resource light, that the awareness about the agricultural insurance is 17%. So you can understand how these people's are lack of awareness about the adaptation measures. And we all know that uh, we have the uh, uh, rice uh, seeds that uh, which are uh, 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 climate resilience ones, and they are not aware about those things. I think we need to make uh, them aware about from the ground level, and uh, we can um, do some uh, 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 workshops for the farmers uh, to uh, build their uh, uh, capacity and we can share our knowledge about those adaptation measures. So I think we can do uh, those things to uh, uh, build their knowledge about and aware about uh, those adaptation strategies. Thank you. And uh, I, I have a personal question that I would like to direct to uh, Professor Silva as well, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. This is, uh, you spoke about sustainability in four sectors, how we need to, uh, um, work on these sectors to move forward and food production processing transport and so on uh, in which sector do you feel that we have made the most progress and uh, if is, is there data about it and also if so which areas do we have to work on really hard and fast thank you uh, yeah uh, so Ramya, if I answer uh, your question um, I also have uh, 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 sort of not very clear uh, answer to your question, uh, frankly, uh, because uh, the interventions and the uh, priority areas are uh, in all aspects, because uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we should not break the, the balance in the food system, uh, giving priority to any area. Uh, and also when we are correcting the uh, the weaknesses, correcting uh, uh, the measures that uh, we are putting forward should also uh, uh, not not break the balance in, uh, we have to pay attention to all the areas. But uh, given the country situation, given the resources that we have, uh, uh, we can intervene in uh, different sectors easily. Uh, one of them is uh, the food waste. Uh, if you if you cut down the food waste, that will uh, a partly or a huge proportion of the problem can be solved in the food system. And also uh, in uh, in uh, production side, uh, there are there are interventions that you can make very easily. Say for example, uh, making making the uh, the 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 resource utilization, I'm using that word uh, frequently because resource utilization is the, one of the areas that anybody can, anybody can uh, be a part of. Uh, so uh, like fertilizer application, uh, pesticide use, all these are, uh, are playing a big role in, in the, uh, the, the input uh, supply chain. So uh, therefore, if you make aware of the, the farmers, uh, in correct uh, cultivation practices, correct uh, animal uh, husbandry practices. So that will make a huge impact. Uh, but my answer to your question is that we have to pick the areas that we can we can uh, uh, intervene in a correct manner, in a uh, easy or quick manner. So that uh, should be chosen uh, 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 according to the 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 resources and the technology uh, available in our uh, system. So uh, production side, yes, there are uh, interventions that you can do, especially to improve the productivity, reduce the, uh, the, uh, the inputs and uh, increase the uh, total factor productivity, input uh, the ratio between output and input, and uh, the, the transportation, uh, and also the waste, you can uh, minimize by little interventions or planning. So uh, uh, that is that is the hope I can uh, I answer your question, uh, uh, Suramya. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Silva. That's uh, very helpful. And of course, it is important for us to all work towards this goal uh, collectively. And that is something that we try to uh, bring about in webinars such as these, so that 
the, the information goes out there and we can have these con conversations, which is very, very important. Um, I also have a question uh, to just let me, give me a second to uh, load it uh, from Chalani. Chalani asks whether if in, in Sri Lankan agriculture, whether if it is based more towards chemical fertilizer, weedicides and pesticides, and what are the directives for organic agriculture at a more national level? Uh, Professor Silva, if you could answer it, and then I have another oh, question. Okay. Okay, okay. So the organic agriculture is uh, is a very uh, sort of uh, widely talk about area. Um, so uh, we have uh, sort of a question in front of us that feeding the nation. So uh, will organic agriculture uh, 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 able to feed the whole nation is a question uh, because we have to talk about the the, the total production as well. Uh, so therefore, we we have to make a balance between the the total organic agriculture and as well as the the mixed form of it. Uh, so we certainly we can minimize the overuse of uh, chemical uh, uh, inputs, but uh, uh, the the total organic agriculture will uh, uh, supply the whole uh, demand uh, to the nation is a question. Uh, but uh, uh, in integrated farming system, you can uh, get an answer to this uh, uh, big problem of uh, uh, extra or, or additional or uh, overuse of uh, certain inputs in agriculture system. Uh, but organic agriculture, yes, it is environmentally friendly and also it, it replenish the, the, the soil, uh, uh, the uh, carbon sink and oh, there are many, many uh, sort of answers uh, to the, uh, the climate resilience system from organic agriculture, but we have to use it in careful manner, in a, in a wise manner, uh, 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 keeping in mind that we have to uh, produce the things or the supply uh, our, uh, the, or the, the, the in, in nutshell, it's, uh, we have to feed the nation. So that is the, 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 the bottom part of it or but a fundamental uh, uh, thing that we have to keep in mind. Uh, we have to bring the, the organic, uh, the, the farming system or, or the whole, whole uh, uh, agriculture sector to make it uh, sort of uh, um, uh, productive enough uh, to feed the nation. So organic agriculture uh, uh, will bring solutions to many problems that uh, we talk about in resilient food uh, systems, but uh, the productivity that we have to maintain in such a way to uh, uh, keep uh, that, uh, the, the feeding the nation in mind. Surame? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Silva. We are putting you on the spot all the time. Oh, Sorry about okay. that. So yeah, many questions directed. <laughs> yeah, I am happy to share my, my yes. views actually. Yes. Uh, Dr. Daniel, Professor Silva, I think maybe you could also add to this. Um, I, I, this is a very broad area, and I'm sure we need to get into sort of a, a lot of expert conversation about it. But could you uh, just touch upon uh, molecular breeding policies in Sri Lanka mm -hmm. and uh, whether if, uh, there are, especially with plants, and uh, whether if there are opportunities that we can uh, go ahead? And uh, this is from uh, uh, Mr. Sujeevan Rajendran, who's asking these questions. Um, so, uh, whether if, is there a future in terms of this? Molecular breeding, breeding. Well, yes. That, that's something a little outside my level. Pradeepa, can you? I can. I, can, I, can, I, can. Uh, I think uh, yes, uh, Dr. Daniel. I think uh, 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 Mr. Suji, uh, yeah, Mr. Suji Rajendran. Uh, uh, he's uh, specifically referring to plant breeding. Uh, yes, uh, Sujivan, uh, there are many aspects coming in uh, plant breeding. Uh, I think you are talking about uh, the, uh, the, the mark assisted selection and these things in uh, molecular breeding. So uh, especially in the case of rice, they have uh, achieved uh, uh, certain uh, 
uh, sort of uh, past certain milestones in uh, uh, bringing uh, the uh, uh, the droughts uh, tolerant varieties soil tolerant vari varieties uh, in uh, rice breeding so uh, these are all uh, 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 sort of a part of the the, the big uh, uh, area of molecular breeding uh, so we have facilities uh, in uh, especially in agriculture faculty we have uh, agriculture biotechnology center where you find a lot of research going on in these aspects uh, 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 to answer the, the the question you asked yes uh, there are uh, uh, some activities programs going on but the policies uh, uh, their policy is not hindering the molecular breeding, but there's no specific policy for uh, molecular breeding. But uh, in a plant breeding, yes, they are using molecular breeding uh, in large extent or large. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, thank you, Professor. Yes, thank you, uh, Professor Silva, because yes. I think uh, the future is there, but there's a lot of work that we have to collectively uh, do, and which is why this youth engagement is really important, mm -hmm. because it is then that we can get all these innovation ideas and put them mm -hmm. across and make mm -hmm. the policies that would suit it uh, mm -hmm. to move forward. There are lots of questions in the uh, chat box. I think we might not be able to uh, answer them all right now, but I'm. Uh, we are very ready to answer these questions. Uh, please reach us, reach out to us and we will uh, definitely answer these questions and they're very valid questions as well. Um, I would uh, like to, we are almost ending our session time. So, we, and we'll be starting a new session at 11.15 uh, that will be on resilient and regenerative food systems in the Tamil language. So we have to make uh, uh, space for them to start their thing, uh, their sessions as well. So I thank from the bottom of my heart to all the panelists. Thank you very much for taking your valuable time and spending it and sharing your uh, expertise and skills and information with us. We are very uh, grateful to do it. And I'm sure the participants are also very happy with this session. Uh, when we are looking at the questions that are coming up, um, I think it has a long way. The interest itself is wonderful because we know that is what is going to make that change. So thank you very much to all panelists. Thank you to all our viewers, uh, uh, especially on the Zoom session, as well as on uh, uh, live stream. So thank you very much. Uh, we would like you to uh, remind you to do the voting as well. Lo go, through, go through those proposals because those proposals are the future and uh, it's from our youth and it makes all the more uh, encouraging when you also participate in this process. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you for all the questions and uh, have a safe uh, uh, day and uh, keep safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Sarana. Thank you, everybody. Yes, Sarana. Thank you very much. Over and out. <laughs>